Hello, bonjour. I'm Andrew Mosker, President and CEO of National Music Center, and this is the NMC Amplifier Podcast. After the war with all the negativity against Germany, which was, I'm sorry to say, they had all every right to feel so, uh, many sold my grandfather their instruments. Now, my grandfather knew that all his family and all my grandmother's family were killed. And he knew that if he's going to buy a German instrument, if nobody wants to buy a German instrument, how can he resell them? So it was knowingly putting his money in danger. My guest today is none other than Avshalom Weinstein, also known as Avshi. <laughs> Avshi is the third generation luthier uh, from Israel, now living in Istanbul, Turkey, and is the custodian of this incredible collection of violins called The Violins of Hope. And I'm really excited to have Avshi on my show today and at this episode of the podcast because the National Music Center has brought in the Violins of Hope collection and has created an exhibition here in Calgary, Alberta, Canada, at the National Music Center that is running from May 3rd to June 16th uh, for seven weeks here at the National Music Center. It's the first international exhibition we've ever done. And there's some wonderful programming that's gonna amplify um, this incredible collection with all of its stories within it. So we'll get into the podcast. Uh, would you please welcome my guest, Avshi Weinstein. Avshi, say hello. Hello there. Thank you so much, Andrew. Happy to be here. This is your first time, not your first time in Calgary because you've been here before when you Yeah, I, I dropped uh, by to bring the instruments for a few hours and then I left, yeah. Then you left. Um, that first trip to Calgary, I remember you drove the violins all the way up from Florida. Yep. Through the continental United States, across the country, and then came through the border of Montana. I mean, how did it feel when you crossed the border into Canada with these violins? Were you well, there excited was a... to get here? <laughs> <laughs> I was excited, of course. It's always exciting to do a new city. We had some issues in the border, but they were all solved. Um, Does that happen and, often when you're crossing international borders with these violins? Uh, it wasn't with the violins. It would be my passport. <laughs> they thought that my passport was not valid. So I needed a visa to Canada while my passport was actually valid. And I don't really need a visa coming with a car. So yeah. <laughs> it was a little bit of a stress for some minutes, but then it was all solved. Well, we're so glad you made it. I remember when you arrived and we took the violins out of your vehicle and brought them up into the gallery. And how did you feel uh, when you came to the National Music Center and you brought these violins? I know it was a long day of driving, um, but did you have any expectations about the building or when you came into the building or when you first saw the, the exhibit itself before the violins were installed? So before even going into the building, seeing it from outside, the unique structure and architecture, it's already like, OK, this is going to be interesting and nice. <laughs> they don't really think in a conventional way and which I like. And then, of course, the elevator is the elevator. It's not a big deal, but... The room, I mean, the two rooms that we have for the exhibit and the whole surrounding is extremely beautiful. Wow. The way you use the space and the timeline and the music around and all the wording and the way the instruments are placed. Really, really bravo. Fantastic. Well, let's go back, take a step back into the whole inception of the Violins of Hope. <clears throat> collection and how it all came to be and the stories contained within this incredible collection of instruments. Um, I, I, I read the book. I read the Violins of Hope book. I, I, I had a hard time putting it down. I found it very, very moving and interesting. Even myself as a, a trained historian and musician, um, the, the history of the Holocaust and the beginnings of the 1930s and what was going on in Europe and how uh, the Jewish community, many of the musicians in the case of Violins of Hope, how each violin had a story re related to a person. <clears throat> so I'd like you to, t uh, to just share a bit about the story of how the collection came to be. I mean, we tell it obviously in the exhibition and it's well documented in the Violins of Hope book. Um, 
the beginnings of it, though, in the 1980s when that first violin arrived. So it actually started before. I mean, after the war, my grandfather, who was already in Israel, um, he bought German-made instruments that people basically didn't want to touch because nobody wanted to touch anything German in Israel, especially after the war. And many of the musicians from the Palestine Orchestra, the Israeli Philharmonic today, when they came, they came from Austria and Germany, and they had very, very good German-made instruments because some of them are as good as the Italians of the same time. Maybe even better. <laughs> I hope nobody's going to crucify me later when I go back to Europe. You but, have every right to say that. You're a professional. Um, <laughs> and after the war, with all the negativity against Germany, which was, I'm sorry to say, they had all every right to feel so. Uh, many sold my grandfather their instruments. Now, my grandfather knew that all his family and all my grandmother's family were killed. And he knew that if he's going to buy a German instrument, if nobody wants to buy a German instrument, how can he resell them? So it was knowingly putting his money in danger. And uh, he did, <laughs> because we have today a very beautiful collection of very good quality of German-made instruments. And they stayed as a collection in our workshop for many years. Until in 1991, my father had, had an apprentice from Dresden, which most of us know that until 1989 was literally Eastern Germany, part of the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. And when he came to our workshop and he saw those instruments, he heard my father's story about them, and he met many of the um, founding members of the orchestra, and of course survivors. This the is Palestine the Palestine Orchestra. Yeah, the Palestine Orchestra, the Israeli Philharmonic, and. Many of those, in the early 1990s, there were still many, many survivors. Mm -hmm. And he heard stories that he never heard before. And it took him about two and a half years to convince my father to come to Germany and give a lecture about those instruments, how they arrived to Israel, show them, because again, like I said, some of them are really very high quality. Um, after that lecture, my father spoke in 1999 on a radio show that was talking about the Holocaust. It was going over, I think, for every week, talking about the Holocaust. And he asked if people had instruments which had any ties to the war. And the very next morning, my father always came late to the workshop. Um, I was there long before him, of course. And we had a phone call. A guy called. He said that he had his uncle's violin. His uncle died, and it was basically the first instrument we got into the collection. A very, very unique instrument because it has a small Star of David inlaid in the back. And the label says, I made this violin for my loyal friend, Mr. Shimon Korngold, Valso 1924. Mm -hmm. Now, Yaakov Zimmerman, the violin maker, was one of the people who trained my grandfather in violin restoration and maintenance. His friend Shimon Kongold was a wealthy industrialist who died, unfortunately, while fleeing the Nazis. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But um, we all know that there were quite few Jewish violinists and musicians before, during, and of course, after the war. And we only know about five Jewish violin makers who worked in Europe before the war. Yaakov Zimmerman was one of them. He was most probably about 70 years old mm -hmm. when the war started. Um, Ida Handel, the legendary violinist, told us that she remembered that she used to go to him with her father. And in the 30s, she said she's not as old as she's supposed to be. But so did my grandparents. Everybody lied with their birth certificates then. Um, she remembered that he had a very long white hair. So most probably, she guessed she was probably around 70 years old. Okay. And people in this age did not survive. Wow. And Yaakov Zigorin is, one of his violins is in the collection. Two. We have, we two. have three in the collection. One is on display here. Two are on display. Two, right as soon as you walk in. Yes. And um, he worked in a shop where in Europe exactly? In Warsaw, in Poland. In Poland. And so your grandfather learned the trade of being a luthier yeah. from, from him. My grandfather was not a violin maker. He was doing small rest restorations and maintenance. 
Um, he claimed he made the top of the violin that he always played on, but it was done when his father was young. So yeah. <laughs> most probably that's not him. <laughs> so it, so from your grandfather Moishi to Am- Amnon, your father, and that that appearance on that radio show, well, the lecture first in Dresden and yeah. then an appearance on a radio show started this to get the word out in a lot yeah. of ways that there was, your father was looking for violins from Holocaust survivors that had a particular story associated with them. And, and so that would have been in the, it started earlier, but it really came, it started. It really started in 1999. In the ni- now the thing 1990s. is this, because if you make a very rough, if you divide it in a very rough way, there were people who talked about what happened to them. And there were people who never said anything. Yeah, it's a common, very common. Which is, again, I'm, I'm not saying anything against them, to be very clear. But what we lost, their stories and history, we mm-hmm. did lose them. Mm-hmm. And we would have all the time people coming to the workshop with my father, grandfather, whatever violin. And sometimes they might know the history. Most of the time they don't. Sometimes they don't even realize the history. Mm-hmm. They might know. You might have been sitting with your grandfather or grandmother or father or mother, and they told you, you know, this is the violin that I was taking from here to there. It helped me like this, like that. They passed away, and okay, it's time to sell, but you don't think to mention, you know, this is what actually happened to this instrument. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, and yeah. then well, that, that's a common challenge. We've had that here at National Music Center when artifacts are donated to us. We try to get a, an, an oral history from whoever's yeah. donating the instrument to us, but sometimes the facts are they're not they're not sure of the facts, and they kind of we're left with an, an incomplete history. It's, it's yeah. quite common. Um, so when did your so who how did your father? document these stories that he re- so if someone is coming it might be the wife the person itself all the kids all grandkids um so we ask them to give us a letter and, and tell the story i mean i don't have the time money or manpower to start doing research like uh jay did in yeah. his book or mm-hmm. other books which were written mm-hmm. i mean i would love to do it but um, already I have my workshop in Turkey <laughs> after my father passing away, unfortunately, two months ago. So I'm going to Israel every month for a few days to work. And I do have violins of all, which is almost every single month, a very long tour to United States, Canada, sometimes Europe. So yeah, it's, uh, so it's you're, tough. So 1999 is really the beginning. And so yeah. 25 years later, this is almost the 25th anniversary in a way this year, um, you've amassed how many violins? Are we have approximately 100 today. And about 100. I know here at the National Music Center, we have just over 40 on display. And then there are others that are being used for performance. Yep. Um, the The collection itself, where was the first place that the Violins of Hope collection was Available, made available to the public in either an exhibition or So the first concert was in 2000 in Istanbul in Turkey. Uh, we had a few instruments, I think three or four. Um, and we used to be a part of a masterclass in Israel that one of my friends from Turkey, um, he used to come and teach. And he told my father, he said, listen, you did such a nice work. Why don't we organize a concert? So he spoke to some of the people from the Jewish um community there there is no federation as far as i know in istanbul in istanbul and they did two concerts and these were basically the first concerts of what today is violins of hope and then we had something in paris and then in israel in 2008 uh the first big concert and exhibit lectures was in 2012 in charlotte north carolina um, and later on, Cleveland, and since then, I honestly do not remember. And then it just, and then it just started. Then it started. Roll. Just it really started to steamroll from there. Yeah, I did quite a bit of research on the Violins of Hope when it was when it was first presented to National Music Center by Dalia Libin and Marnie Bondar. They called me 
uh, less than two years ago about this idea about presenting the violins of hope here. So I just found out th where this collection had been. And when I realized how, how much it had been all over the world, I immediately was, was so excited to bring it to National Music Center as our first international exhibition. But, but in all of the travels that you've experienced with Violence of Hope, what are some of the more memorable ones that stick out? And, you know, if it started in 2008 and then North Carolina, then Cleveland, Ohio, we had, part, what are um, some of the, what are some of the places that you were, that we had a very out? nice concert in Berlin in, in 2015. Berlin. Um, with the Berlin Philharmonic? Yeah, with the Berlin Philharmonic. Very famous 70, orchestra. Yeah. One of us still is one of the very, very best. Yeah. Um, it was 70 years to the liberation of Wall Street, 27 of January. It must have been so moving just it to was, be in Berlin and to have these violins. Listen, played. I am a third generation and I grew up on Holocaust stories. I'm sure for my father it was very, very different because his parents never spoke about it, about their families. I grew up in a family. My, grew up, my father grew up with his mother, his father, and later his sister. I grew up with my grandparents and that grandparents and these cousins and that cousins. And if I, if I need to spend one day with every one of my cousins around the world, I need to be away for a very, 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 <laughs> very long time. Yeah. My father had no one. Yeah. For him, I'm sure it was very, very different. Um, I cannot say that for me this was like just an, another concert. Of course, listen, this is Berlin, Germany. The re uh, liberation of Auschwitz. I mean, it's it, it is a very, very meaningful and very significant date, place, and time. Were the violins on exhibit as well, or there was an exhibit and yeah. also a concert? Yeah, the, there was one concert, um, and the violins stayed, I think, for about three weeks on exhibit inside the Berlin Philharmonic Hall. Mm. Mm -hmm. They have a very big foyer. We had three or four big vitrines there. Mm -hmm. I think either 12 or 16. We had a total of 16 most probably. Mm -hmm. in. So I think they were all on display. How did, the music, how did the musicians in Berlin for such a famous orchestra feel about having to play these instruments? I first? can't say. That I'm not, I cannot say that they were happy. I mean, in the end, this is... The history is known, mm -hmm. uh, but they were very, very respectful and very well. I mean, they they wanted to do it. They all took the instruments and they all played the instruments. So mm -hmm. they were very engaged. Fantastic. Um, and so Berlin was like the first one that, for all of the reasons that you've just outlined, you know, in Germany... Bill and Berlin Philharmonic, the first concert of that stature. Any other, uh, any oh, other stories? Had any so others many. that stick out for you? Uh, Cleveland was really nice. Um, in Nashville, we had I don't know how I don't even remember how many concerts. Yeah, talk talked about Nashville. That's, that one's interesting. You know, Music City, USA. You know, known for country music and the American music industry headquarters in so many different ways. What was it like to have Violence of Hope in Nashville? So we had a very beautiful exhibit in the library there. In the library. Yeah, Nashville. so we had one room which was only for the violins. And inside on the second floor, we had, um, there was lots of space for different um, genocides, basically. And they didn't really know how to do it. And there was an open space that said, why don't we make a violin making table, you know? Yeah. So they did a nice corner that was like oh, a like violin a, making oh, yeah. table with okay. tools and stuff and things. And so we had, I think, about 10 concerts mm -hmm. all together. Um, and one of the nice things there, before we came, they got an email from a guy who lives very close to Nashville, a double bass player, jazz double bass player. Okay. And he told him that he has a double bass that belonged to a person named Avraham Rosner, who played it while he was working for Schindler. Oh, really? Yes. Wow, in Poland. And Incredible. They, they were a few brothers, and they were made by the Nazis to play jazz and stuff and at nights in the parties. And after the war, one of the 
people he found he found him in New York and sent him the double bass and the all the orchestra wanted to play all the double basses player wanted to play that bass so they would rotate between uh the movements all the time so you saw like <laughs> there was all the time movement on the stage the bass was like on a wheel no 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 they they, they just moved between them oh wow between chairs okay interesting and Did, this was very nice i mean you see the respect that people have yeah we're in nashville i'm just curious were any of the concerts um played on the violins in you know other styles of music in country music or what we call um, now americana or roots music or was I'm it i'm not so sure so i think so but i've been to the classic ones with the uh, symphony so um i'm trying to think i i don't know you don't know we a, were there for two months give or take so okay. i couldn't be the whole time i always ask that question about when speaking from national music center perspective because <clears throat> here at national music center all styles of music are part of the of, of canada's national music story and the world's national music story so for violence of hope we have two two programs two concerts programmed which we're very excited about um one is a jewish artist from montreal who is a klezmer hip-hop jazz artist named so called he's an incredible artist and he happens to be touring with a string quartet now but mm-hmm. he's mostly a hip-hop artist And um, uh, Lenka Leitenberg from Toronto. She's originally from the Czech Republic and uh, is a songwriter and a composer. Um, and she'll be performing with two violins in her singing. More of a contemporary approach to singing songs in English, in Yiddish, and in Czech. Uh, also a Jewish artist. So, and then the Philharmonic, Calgary Philharmonic last night or on Wednesday, You know, performed a, a, I would say, more of a, a fairly traditional program that you would yep. hear a symphony orchestra perform. So it kind of rounds off with the giving um, a different interpretation of the, the Violins of Hope collection. So that's something that we, we do here often at National Music Center, try to add different genres of music. And so these violins, hearing about them being in Nashville, I was really, really curious about who would have played them and what they would have played on them. I can check it out. Yeah. I don't know, but... <laughs> For me, I tell you honestly, there is only one rule when we do a project like that, yeah. is we don't play Wagner on these instruments. You don't, and, play, you don't and, play Wagner on these yeah. instruments. That's interesting. Any other thing you want to play, hip-hop, rock, classic, I mean, it's okay with Do me. you give those kinds of guidelines in the, when, you, when the instruments are loaned, that you don't yeah. play this? You do. I didn't know that. Only Wagner. That's the only Only thing. Wagner. Interesting. I understand why. Um, so Nashville, Cleveland, I could imagine Cleveland was a very interesting yep. experience. One of the great orchestras in the world in Cleveland, a long, long, long history. Um, one connection to Violence of Hope and the Palestine Orchestra. I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but as you were probably aware that Arturo Toscanini was the first conductor of the Palestine Orchestra. But there Orchestra. was another guy who was preparing them. That's right. For the concert. That's right. And he was later on in, um, Did he come here or did he go to... Well, Art- Arturo Toscanini was also at one time the music director of the Cleveland Symphony Orchestra. Yeah. The long, long, long history of great classical music in Cleveland with that orchestra. So what was that experience like with for the violins to be in Cleveland? When the, the concert with the Cleveland Symphony was we opened up a new art performance center, which used to be one of the big synagogues there. And went through a huge restoration. Um, and of course, listen, the Cleveland Symphony is, it is a great orchestra. It's a great orchestra, yeah. Literally great orchestra. And it was an amazing concert. Yeah. Did they do an exhibit there? Of the exhibit? Yeah, there was an exhibit in the Maltz Museum. I think 16 instruments, give or take, something like that. Okay. <laughs> wow. Hey, sorry for the interruption. I just have a quick favor to ask. If you enjoy the show... Please take a moment to give us the highest rating you can on your podcast app. Or if you're watching on YouTube, please give us a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel. It really helps us out. National Music Center is a registered charity with a mission to amplify the love, sharing, and understanding of music, and we rely on donor support to achieve this mission. 
If you like this show or anything else the National Music Center is doing, please consider leaving a donation by following the link in the description. The, the, let's just uh, kind of switch gears and just talk a little bit more about the violins themselves. So, and you and your father's, your father's professional relationship and why you became a luthier yourself. Um, was it when Abnon was working on these violins, were you just in the shop helping him and then decided at some point in your life you wanted to continue? In I was working with him before that. Um, I started full time in the workshop in 1998, but also before that I was all the time doing things and working a little bit and learning. The, and you um, and you learned your trade specifically from yeah. your father. Yeah. And uh, what? How did uh, how did some of these stories resonate with you? Like when I think when I go through the collection that we have here on exhibit here in Calgary, there's certainly a few that stand out for me. But are there certain violins that stand out for you? So my personal opinion is that we have to make sure that all the stories are going to come out. And I don't have a personal favorite because I think that everyone's story is important. Yeah. Of course, people can choose if they have something sure. which is more touching to them or not. Um, but there are some instruments, for example, the... Max Becker Valley. Yeah. So mm -hmm. his brother in law, Wolf Domauschkin, played concerts with my grandfather in Vilna before the war. We found, my father found a concert program from 1936. Incredible. Of one of the Jewish uh, composers, Joel Engel. The conductor was Wolf Domauschkin, and my grandfather played viola. He might have known also uh, Max Becker. I don't know, but I checked the program, and Max Becker's name was not there. Most probably they actually knew each other because they were approximately the same age, give or take. So you have all these connections, you know, like this and that, right here, left. and Yeah, they're so. fa I mean, they're fascinating stories. I mean, I wrote down a couple that really resonated with me personally, and I don't know why um, specifically, but Abram Rzinski's story. That's a very interesting story for me just because he was in Auschwitz in Birkow, and uh, he was not a trained musician, but promised himself that he would learn the violin if he survived. And he did, and played till the end of his life. Yeah. Did you know him? No. Never met him? Um, we got his violin from a German violin maker who got it from the family. He left that violin to a family in Germany that they stayed with after the war. And... They didn't know what to do with the violin, and they gave it to the violin maker. The, the violin is it's eighty percent machine made. Yeah, you know. Again, but this is what those people had. Sure, sure. Um, basic instruments. Very basic. Very very basic. Yeah. But this is how you tell a story. I mean, if you will only have Stradivarius and Guarneri's in the collection. I'll be very happy, but I don't know how we're going to pay the insurance and shipping. Yeah, the you know, yeah, that would be a big issue. Very big issue, particularly um, for, you know, organizations like for ours. For smaller too. places, yeah. I mean, you end up paying God knows how many thousands of dollars a day for the insurance. It's, yeah. uh, it's tough, but the good stuff was confiscated by the Nazis. And this is... Well, that's, what, inter that's interesting, because when you look, when you walk around the collection now... You know, as a historian myself that likes to look at dates, um, there's quite a few instruments in the collection. There's a few that actually are from the 18th century and some obviously that are newer than that. But age doesn't necessarily mean expensive and quality instruments. So, yeah. so how would you rate the, the, the quality of the collection? So the most part of it, that would be student kind of level okay. give or take okay there are a few which are better and one or two which are really much better okay interesting but this is not the great stuff i understand it's if the you, stories yeah i mean in the end like i said they did confiscate the good stuff well that's an they knew study they knew monet uh, or rembrandt and all these great artists yeah yeah the, yeah, the Nazis were famous for stealing art 
and, and that's that's very well known. One thing that's similar to the collection here at National Music Center, some of the most prized pieces in our collection are not necessarily the best quality of instrument. We have this piano from Elton John. As okay. Name. Elton John and his, his, his partner, Bernie Topin, his lyricist, wrote mm, five albums of songs on this piano from the late 60s to the early 1970s. Some of Elton John's most famous songs. The piano uh, is a worthless, upright piano that is worth nothing. But it's because Elton and Bernie it's wrote <laughs> all kinds of music on this this instrument and signed the piano and have validated it that when they were starting out... The, this they, is the one. This is where they wrote the song Tiny Dancer. This is where they wrote the song... Um, um, your song. This is where they wrote the next song and so on. So it's the connection to them as songwriters and performers that are well, Elton in this case, a songwriter and a performer known around the world that inspires people to want to see this piano. Of course. And I would. I mean, this is... When you talk about really the great stuff, so some of the instruments are named after their owner or the musician who played them. And uh, it does give some extra bucks. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Like the, the, So Abram Merzinski is one story. There's a connection to Canada. There's two connections to Canada that I wanted to chat with you about. Uh, Fanny Heck. Yeah. So Winnipeg. You know, um, when I read about that story, about how that violin ended up in Winnipeg, which is not too far from Calgary. It's about a, 12 a day hour. ride. It's a day drive. <laughs> A short flight and a long and a and a and a long twelve hour drive. There's a very strong and always has been a very strong Jewish community in Winnipeg. I know I've spent a lot of time there. Uh, there's a wonderful art gallery there, the Winnipeg Art Gallery, the mm. Canadian Museum. I did some projects with them. It was did you? It was very challenging. <laughs> I won't tell them that. Uh, I'll tell you off record. Is that the um, Winnipeg Art Gallery or the Canadian Museum of Human Rights? Which one? I think both. Think both. <laughs> so they're both in Winnipeg, and um, uh, and so that when I read about that Fanny Hex violin ending up there. That was just a nice coincidence and, and from a Canadian perspective. How did that violin come to Israel from Winnipeg? The family brought it. The family brought it. Helena's son and uh, daughter-in-law. Okay. They flew to Israel and they brought it to us. Incredible. So that whole story of making the journey to Israel to, to, to just bring this violin yeah. to this And court. then they also went to Yad Vashem to look for Fanny Hecht, her husband and the kids and they found in the records that they were all killed in different camps wow. on different days. Wow. That's, well, it's just these incredible stories in Violence of Hope, the book. Each chapter is a story of hope and survival. And I think even courage, you know, um, especially the trip all the way to Palestine from Europe, <clears throat> you know, to Angola, not Angola, but to the... Um, no, which is... Yeah, Mauritzer, exactly. And and living there and then trying to get into Palestine and then being turned around and having to go back. And just these each chapter tells these incredible stories of that that don't occur over one day or one week, but over many years of just trying to flee and how these various instruments uh were part of that story. Another one that really caught my attention was Agualtiero Morpugo. Uh, from Italy, which is not a um, something we don't think about Italy often when we think about the Holocaust. Now, now but there was a very there was a vast um, expulsion of Jews there. I think it was forty three um, when they after the Americans invaded Italy, the Nazis literally took over and just expelled everyone. Yeah, I I I have visited uh, Trieste. Myself, I've been there a number of years ago, and it was very moving to go there. And so when I heard, when I read this story of this engineer, Gualtiero Mopugo, which, again, the violin itself, uh, a, a basic violin. No, the violin is a good violin, but he's in horrifying condition. That particular I one. I mean, this is something I would not sell to a client. <laughs> okay. The story is interesting how... He, him, and his mother were separated, and his mom ended up on a train to Auschwitz, and him in the labor camp. 
and um, eventually he became uh, a, um, a builder, a, a shipbuilder of boats and yeah. helped Jewish people escape and flee yeah. to safety. And that part of the exhibitions is all about songs of survival. And there are quite a few different instruments in that collection that have very interesting stories. So that one resonated with me because my family's from Italy and that was one of the few Italian stories that I could, that, that are in, that's in the, this yep. current exhibit. Another one was the story of the violin being thrown out, thrown outside of the train. Yep. What, what, what can you tell us about I that? I mean, we don't story? really know much. Um, the Nazis did use music and musicians. So, but the guy, he was going from France, probably from Lyon to the east, Auschwitz or one of the camps. We, we cannot know. And once those trains were the last priority, so if something had to happen, they moved aside and they had to wait God knows how many how many days and hours. Um, and he saw people working on the tracks and he just threw the violin to them, uh, telling them that the place he's going, they, he won't need the instrument. Not knowing basically that actually if you come as a musician, your chance of living is much higher. Because the Nazis needed the musicians, uh, and many musicians survived. Many of them, of course, never played again, but many musicians did survive. You mentioned you told that story at the on stage at the Calgary Philharmonic Orchestra the other night about a violin, <clears throat> about a woman specifically who played in one of those orchestras, Violet Silberstein, yes, and never played again, and. Do you? Th why do you think? Why do you think that that was just because of the the trauma associated? Some of those people, um, sometimes the orchestras, most of the time, they had to play when the inmates had to go out, and then when they had to come back in in the evening. And in some of the places, they had to bring everybody back, meaning all the people who died during the day, and many times they would be piled up just in front of the orchestra. Mm -hmm. And they had to play mm -hmm. every single day outside in a Calgary weather. Yeah. If not worse. Mm -hmm. With almost no clothes, not even at the minimum of food. Mm -hmm. Horrifying condition. And basically with a gun to your head mm -hmm. the whole time. And I guess she couldn't... She, she became a very good singer, but she never touched her violin again. I understand yeah just the it's good to, it's interesting to to discuss why people are motivated or why they're not the violence of hope <clears throat> exhibition and collection is such a, a moving story about this violin and the music associated with it could potentially keep me alive during this horrific time but after that time is over a different period of their life begins yeah. and it may not involve music or violins in some cases and that's certainly the case with some of these examples in this yeah, collection my father had a client um he was a he was in one of the camps i think in romania mm -hmm. and the commander of the camp uh he realized he learned that he's a very talented boy so he used to take a teacher from one of the villages around to bring him and bring him and he helped the boy study and become better. He even took his parents once or twice down from the trains going to other camps. And when this boy, and when he survived and he arrived to Israel, the first thing he did was to sell the violin. Yeah. Many years later, he went back to playing, went into the Israeli Philharmonic and stayed there until retirement. But he, the first thing he did was to sell that violin. Yeah, it's interesting. It, it, it's 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 so individualistic in the case in the case of Abram Merzinski, his his commitment to himself was to learn the violin once the war was over, and for others that played it during the Holocaust were to maybe just for whatever reason they just decided to stop playing. There are so many um, interesting stories within all of these violins, and how do you how do you feel? with all of these various stops that you've made since 2008, 2015, more recently up until the present, what, what, what kind of impact are you, what is your vision for Violins of Hope going forward? So we were 
asked if he would like to have an, a permanent exhibit. Where? In Israel. In Israel. Uh, okay. Someone was hoping to buy a certain place, um, make it a museum, and then he wanted to have an exhibit there. The thing is that, okay, you'll have a certain amount of people coming for the exhibit. But I've done projects in, and I've visited schools in places that people don't even know the names of. I mean, I've seen 25,000 students personally in the Knoxville, Tennessee area. Mm. <laughs> we would go to three different schools a day in places that I'm sure 95% of Americans wouldn't even know on the map. Yeah, small And this is America. only Knoxville, Tennessee. Yeah, small town America. So I've been talking to about 300,000 students okay. all around the United mm -hmm. States. Now, the thing is this. You have some amazing Holocaust museums all around the world. Mm -hmm. But not everyone can go there. Not mm -hmm. every student will, be, will have the chance to. And being able to take the instruments from place to place, and like what you've done here to bring the students to the exhibit or to go to the school with some instruments, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. giving them, let's say, 40 to 50 minutes of Holocaust education that they might not get mm -hmm. otherwise, mm -hmm. for me, it's a bit more important than having a permanent exhibition. Mm -hmm. So you, you, your vision is to keep this exhibition on the road, yeah. around the world, wherever it can go, wherever it can educate and inspire people yeah. about the story of the Holocaust. I think this is more important than having a permanent exhibit um, that people can go to. Yeah. I, I think, again, my... There are lot, listen, you have Yad Vashem, you have the one in D.C. There are so many, and a friend of mine told me now they are looking for money to buy it, to do one in in Phoenix, uh, I have nothing against it. And they can bring, during all the years, students and stuff, which is great. Mm -hmm. But again, there are lots of places that will never have this chance. Mm -hmm. I understand. One, one of the reasons why we're, we're so excited about bringing Violence of Hope here, <clears throat> the human story, the international story, the power of music story, <clears throat> um, what's unique about the Violins of Hope collection is that some of the instruments play and they can be used to perform on, as you know. This is part of what Violins of Hope is, um, to hear the voices of these instruments again. We have a similar approach here at National Music Center. It's quite unique in the museum world. Uh, we often like to think of ourselves... I know, I was uh, sidelined a few times because... What, you were sidelined a few times yeah. in other places. Yeah. Interesting. What do you What do you mean you were sidelined a few we'll times? We'll do it off record. Yeah. <laughs> okay. It's in. There's a few of those. There's a few of those that are off record. But I under, I know exactly what you're going to tell me because when we began the National Music Center, part of our mandate was to and desire was to present a living collection of musical instruments to help artists educators, artists at any level, professional or amateur or emerging, have access to instruments and equipment that was historic in nature. And not everybody agrees with that, you know, playing historic instruments. Um, there is some controversy about doing that and some people that don't believe that that, you sh that that should be done to historic instruments. But we feel very strongly about it here at NMC and in our studios. We've got lots of historic instruments and equipment, as you know, that artists can use. And part of it is not only for creating new music, but also for education. So Violins of Hope, was that always the intent, similar, similar to National Music Center? Was it always the intent when your father started to restore these violins that... So violins, only, if... That they should be played. You know that if you take a musical instrument... And you restore it nicely. Yeah. And you put it on display. Yeah. It's going to last very, very long. Yeah, it will. And if you that's play right. on it, you'll need to work on it every once in a while. Yeah. That's but right. But in the end, they are made for playing. Exactly. And we believe the same thing. I here. mean, this is, 
We do have a few instruments that we will not restore, like the Heil Hitler value yeah. and a few others which are really like, they're never going to sound. Yeah, yeah. Okay? I understand, yeah. But in general, yes, this instrument, the main thing is to bring them back to stage for people to, to play and, and have the feeling of this is what these, those people heard, give or take. Yeah. Mm -hmm. These are mm -hmm. modern strings and they probably didn't have, and these instruments are maintained in a very, very nice way that they couldn't get it then, but still, this is, What do you, I mean, I'm not a collector of violins, yeah? Uh, I think violins should be played. Yeah. Well, we agree with you. And we're grateful. I know there's many people that are very grateful for the fact that those violins can still be performed on and can be heard. And the fact that you've actually been able to capture some of the history and continue to capture it is an ongoing thing, as you know. This history, you're always learning new things. Yep. You know, you might meet someone that knows something about an existing violin that you never heard, and then suddenly the history of that violin changes. That's normal. And we that happens around here often. You know, I mean, what we knew about something 20 years ago might be very different than what we know about it today. Um, the the um, where are, Where would you like the Violins of Hope collection to go where it has not been yet? Do you have any... Have you thought Anyone about it? Anyone who wants me, I'll be more happy <laughs> right. to work with them. You're so modest. I'm, I'm not, You're very modest. You know, people tell me, but don't you go and check and start? I say, listen, <laughs> I cannot do production in every city I'm going to. Yeah. I don't know Calgary, like I don't know Fort Lauderdale and West Virginia. And I can give you now a very long list of sure. places that I've been to and will go. And I have to trust the people that I'm working with that their intention would be to do the best project they can uh -huh. and with the best intentions they have. I, I cannot, there is a limit of what I as a one person who does have a family that wants to see him from time to time can do. I mean, my wife, my wife has a career. I need that. I mean, today we sat in the morning and I had to write down all the dates that I have to be home and that's it because she's busy with concerts and other programs that I have to be home to take care of the kids. I mean, the cat is nice, but I understand the cat cannot open the door and make dinner, <laughs> you know? So, um, I'll go. I've never said no to a project. I always find the way to do it. Where has violins? I'm just let's just, we just think about the world for a minute. So it's been in the United States, it's been in Canada, many places in Europe. Um, Guadeloupe. In Guadeloupe. Well, interesting. In the Caribbean, interesting. A French yeah. protectorate island. Yeah. Guadeloupe. Um, and we did a project with the with the local players there. That's very interesting. Guadeloupe. They have an amazing pianist there. Incredible. Hmm. Has it ever been into anywhere in 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 Japan? We have not gone gone into I've, that part of Asia. I wish, not yet. I wish Australia. I tried. Okay. <laughs> Didn't work out. <laughs> South America, anywhere. South in America, yes. We've done a very beautiful project in Argentina last year. Okay. Uh, with the German embassy there. Excellent. Um, wow. we in Mexico, for example. In Mexico, I had something very fun. That's interesting. Mexico City? City, yeah. Okay. Um, they wanted to do kind of a musical uh, foundation. And a lady came in with her father's clarinet. And, ah, so you're from Israel? I said, yes. Violin? Wow. She goes like, you know, my brother, he plays violin. But you wouldn't know him. He's an amateur. I said, what's the name? No, nah, you wouldn't know him. He's a lawyer. He's an amateur. You wouldn't know him. I said, what is the name? She goes, the video on. I said, of course I know the video on. He's my lawyer. <laughs> He's a <your> lawyer. <laughs> He's my... And she brought me his father's clarinet because this is how he survived. Interesting. And he never said a word. And he knew about Violins of Hope since day one. And this was in Argentina. This was Mexico, in Mexico City. Mexico City. Wow, amazing. So that kind of, again, wherever Violins of Hope goes. It, there I were love... Jewish people spread like. All over, all over the world. All over the world. I heard about um, an accordion in 
Ecuador or something like that. The guy mm. managed to get on a ship and the whole time he was playing on the ship and he arrived to Ecuador, one of those places. Incredible. We have a violin from the Shanghai ghetto. Mm. Now, I don't know how much you know, but today if you go for an audition in almost everywhere in the world, there are going to be lots of Chinese people coming. Yeah. The first people who brought classic Western classical music and taught it in China were the Jewish immigrants in the late 30s because China was the only place they could go without a visa. Interesting. Many left afterwards, but there was about 40,000 people in the ghetto in Shanghai. And they were the first people to teach Western classical music in China. That's a that's an incredible piece and, of and, history. And you yeah. know, if you look on the numbers now, I think... Someone told me in the Shanghai, Beijing area, some good amount of years ago, there were 900,000 violinists. Send them it. one set of strings. Make yeah. one dollar on the set every year. Yeah, I believe it. Then you can it's, sit down, trust me. Oh, God. It's like pianos, you know. So many um, pianists in classical music come from China. Many, many. You have millions. Yeah, I mean, millions. many, many, many. It's, uh, I didn't know that... Um, that the Jewish community in the 1940s, 30s, who ended up in Shanghai, were really responsible for introducing classical music to China. I don't know if introducing, but teaching it. Teaching it. They yeah. were the, the first teachers. And that's because of violin, and Violins of Hope has a connection to that. That's really fantastic. We have a violin for one of those teachers. That's yeah. fantastic. So you've been, so Violins of Hope continues to make its way around the world. Yep. Um, how many times has it been in Canada? Like We've done something in... We had a violin on exhibit in Montreal some years ago. Okay. Uh, we've done... Last year, we've done something small in Winnipeg. That's it. Okay. I tried Toronto. I you tried Toronto. Out, but we will be later on this year in Toronto. Good, good. So this is the third stop here in Calgary. This is the biggest event we st- we ever had in, in Canada, basically. Yeah, good. That's good. Um so what are your, um, how does it feel to be in Calgary? I know you're away from home, you're away from family. Uh, any any impressions about being in Calgary? And I mean, the, I like the, the, the city. National... I like walking down the river, up and down. I'm not a city person. I mean, I, people try. So it's a beautiful city. Every city I go, I mean, even Paris. For me, Paris, the Paris I know, is wake up at 5 o'clock in the morning, go to the flea markets, look for violins. Good. I prefer that than going to the Louvre and do sure. all this stuff. And um, your thoughts on National Music Center, seeing this building? I mean, this is, like I said, when I just arrived, seeing it already from outside, it was very intriguing to see the inside. And once I saw a little bit of the inside, of course, last this past few weeks, past week, I've seen so much more. It's... Very beautiful what you've done I like here. What you, I liked what you said at the beginning of uh, our, you know, our, our our talk today. That as soon as you saw the building, you went, mm, "This is different." And I mean, there I, is, li- I like it, the it way is different. Yeah, yeah. And just the approach, I think, is 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 different than what we do here and how we approach music. I mean, edu- I'm sure it's education. much easier to make a square building, bigger rooms, smaller rooms, yeah, higher ceiling, lower ceiling, whatever. This window, that window, but. Okay, but this one gives you the nice feeling of, okay, what's going to be around the next corner? Yeah, and that was the idea of, you know, invention and surprise. Yeah. And really through music, you know, because this is an education organization primarily. And people who come here learn about music, about history, about musical instruments, about culture, about themselves, about how music can heal um, about their favorite artists that inspired them at one time in their life or even today. And so it's always a, it, we're all about discovery a- around every corner that there's something new to learn, just like with Violence of Hope. I mean, I think we've learned a lot from bringing this collection here and building an exhibit, particularly at this time, right now in 2024, in May 2024, with everything going on in the world. Um, and in Israel. <laughs> yeah, and in Israel. I mean, we felt, and I think this is important for this podcast, we, when um, when the Calgary Jewish Federation reached out to us, as I said earlier, to do this exhibition about a little less than two years ago, 
I immediately was very excited about the opportunity, and I and I and I had a meeting with Jesse, our senior director of exhibitions, who you've worked closely with, on this exhibition, and I said, "What do you think? Should we bring this? Should we build an exhibition with the Violence of Hope?" I think we should, and he said, "Yeah, this would be awesome. Let's do it." So that was well before October the seventh, twenty twenty three, but even as we approached. Um, um, the period after October 7th. And we started to see, even in Canada, protests and, and, and anxiety and the things that were going on around anti-Semitism specifically. We, we still felt that it was important to move forward and bring this collection here. Others, we have seen other events canceled in North America. Um, and in Canada, specifically. And we, we talked about it as a team, and we felt that this was an important story to tell. This was an important story about hope and resilience. And I know the Calgary Jewish Federation felt the exact same way with working with Marty and Dahlia. And uh, it was a, a, a great opportunity for us to show how music can bring people together, yeah. to talk and to learn from each other. And to understand things that maybe people don't understand. And also to learn, I think, the stories about these the people behind these violins, including yourself, Avshi, and your family. And, you know, the work that you do, which is exhausting work, I understand that. It takes up a lot of time. You shared that enough, you know, today about you being away from your family. And you never say no. You'll go wherever this exhibition will take you. But it requires resources and it requires yep. time. Um, but the stories are incredibly powerful to share. And in the short amount of time that this exhibition has been open, I've seen it. I've seen it in the visitors. I've heard from so many people in the community how moved they are by these stories in this collection. And I'm very proud that our team and the board here at the National Music Center agreed with all of us to move forward and do this, uh, even at this time in uh, in our history, and um, I know that we've all learned so much from it, and we're we're just excited about even the the remaining weeks we have until June sixteenth, because uh, the concerts that we're going to put on, the artist in residence program we're going to have, yep. that uh, Daniel Pelton is going to compose a, is composing a new work. That's going to be recorded with Kensington Symphonia, series of string players that live here um, in as a tribute to not only um, these these instruments, but a narrative about the Holocaust itself. Um, and we're just, you know, grateful for the opportunity. And, well, uh, thank you. I mean, you've done you've done all the work with the Federation here and Dali and Marty. I mean, I just brought the instruments and I'm talking a bit here, a bit there, but all the scheduling and all the production and all the things all around it, which makes it what it is, that's all your work. Are there any other, uh, are there any other thoughts you'd like to share just about Violence of Hope, its future, how you so, feel? I mean, being here in Calgary and Canada again? And like I said, the programs here are really nice. I really enjoyed having the kids coming in um, and you see that some of them are really engaged. Some of them are really, really interested. And this is not an easy thing to talk, to tell kids, you know what I mean? Because we are talking about a massive amount of dead people in horrifying ways. And they are still engaged, are still coming and looking and asking questions, taking photos, you know, you see them reading the stuff. Some would talk about it later, some wouldn't, but at least they are a little bit, you see that they are engaged, that they are interested. I, was, and I think that this is the only way to fight hate. Leave it now against this or that or whatever. Hate. Hate in general. Um, it's for education. Well, I commend you for uh, um, spending a lot of time in front of students. You know, whether it's everywhere violence of hope goes. I mean, we were, you know, very excited by the fact that we were able to bring 2,700 
grade 11 students here to the National Music Center for a Holocaust Symposium. We've never done that, anything like that ever here. I mean, we've had big events and we've had panel discussions about music, uh, but we've never had a Holocaust Symposium here specifically with, uh, with high school students. And just to have those students in the building every day and see them and hear them listening to you or other presenters for the symposium. Are you often, are you ever surprised by questions that they ask you? Are you, are you? No, I'm, you? I'm, I'm very open with things. I mean, I know, I know the exhibit. I know what happened. I know that I know the right things and the truth. And I'm very comfortable with the way I live my life as a Jewish person, Israeli. I'm, I'm not practicing Judaism. Yeah. But I'm comfortable where I am. And if they have questions, uh, sometimes it's a bit harder. Sometimes it's a bit more regular questions. But it's always interesting because the kids, we have to make sure they know that these things happen. Yes. And it yeah. happened not by aliens. For them, 1940, this is like, there is no selfies from the God's chambers. How do you know it happened? Guys, come on. It did. Mm -hmm. We've, I mean, not we, but human beings have done it. There is nothing that will stop us doing it again mm -hmm. unless we educate our kids and the rest of the world that that's not the way to solve problems. No. Uh, and uh, so again, I, I commend you. We agree at National Music Center and I certainly um, came from an education and music background and I've seen music save lives. I've seen music bring people together. I've seen music change lives and people's perceptions about their own biases, whatever those biases are. And uh, it's just been, uh, you know, a real delight and honor to to welcome you to Calgary into the National Music Center and this incredible collection. Like, I'm inspired to go take violin lessons. You know, <laughs> I really am. You know, I tried and, it when I was a child. That wasn't you know, good. <laughs> I play a few things, but I'm like, I'm gonna take some violin lessons and uh, just to make some sound from these incredible instruments, which are very moving instruments. You know, like the aesthetic of the violin, the sound of the violin. I wish you a good health and Thank you. uh, in your journeys around the world with violin, your continued journeys. And I, and I hope we can see you again here in Calgary. Me too. I'll be more than happy to do that. And I definitely would love to visit you in Istanbul on, uh, on some You trip. let me okay. know when. I will. And, I'll take and you potentially in Israel. Food. And potentially in Israel. Also very good food. Yeah. Much more expensive, but still very good. <laughs> That's great. Thanks for being here, Afshi. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to the National Music Center's podcast, NMC Amplifier, with me, Andrew Mosker. We have lots of other great content online for free, including live performances, videos, articles, podcasts, interviews with artists, and more. Head over to amplify.nmc.ca and check it out. National Music Center is a registered charity with a mission to amplify the love, sharing, and understanding of music. And we rely on donor support to achieve this mission. If you like the show or anything else NMC is doing, please consider leaving us a donation. NMC Amplifier is recorded on Treaty 7 in Mukinstis, Calgary, Alberta, Canada, at Studio Bell, home of the National Music Centre. To learn more about National Music Centre, go to studiobell.ca. Thanks again for tuning in. Until next time, au revoir.